Now look at section 1. Section 1. You will hear a woman making a telephone call about joining a cycling club. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, is that the cycling club? That's right. How can I help you? I'm Beth. I've just moved to the village and have been thinking about getting involved with a cycling group. Hi, Beth. I'm James and I'm the club secretary. We're always keen to welcome new members. The man says that he is the club secretary, so secretary has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, is that the cycling club? That's right. How can I help you? I'm Beth. I've just moved to the village and have been thinking about getting involved with a cycling group. Hi Beth, I'm James and I'm the club secretary. We're always keen to welcome new members. Have you got much cycling experience? Not really. Does that matter? Not at all. There are lots of cycling opportunities here. For example, some of our members take part in competitions throughout the year, if you're interested in that. Otherwise, we meet each weekend and just go cycling. We take a different route each time, ranging from easy to challenging, so there's something for everyone. Oh, sounds fun. It is. Is there a joining fee? And what's included if there is? There's an annual membership. It isn't much, but it covers things like our newsletter, which we email to members every few weeks, informing them of what's going on. We also have regular meetings here at the community centre. There's a small extra fee for that to cover refreshments, as well as any guest speakers who come along to talk to us about diet, avoiding injury, that kind of thing. Great idea. Helpful for me to know about that kind of thing as an inexperienced cyclist. Oh, and if you do join, we're giving all new members a free repair kit. We used to give a free water bottle for people's bikes, but most bikes come with those now, so... Oh, that's useful. Now, do you meet at the community centre before you go on rides? No, we meet outside the post office in Dudley. Oh. I haven't heard of that. How do you spell it? It's the next village. It's D-O-U-G-L-E-Y. The reason we meet there is because there's a large car park, which is handy for people from outside the area who drive in. Ah, got it. And what would I need to bring if I went on any of the weekend rides? Do you have proper cycling gear? There's a great local cycling shop which has some great offers on for our members at the moment. Long-sleeved t-shirts are very popular in this cold weather. And I bet you've never tried warmers for your knees before, have you? And do you have a pair of cycling gloves? You'd be amazed by how much the right clothing makes a difference to your comfort and abilities. Mm, I'm sure. Well, the shop will sort you out with what you need. Um, anything else you'd like to know? Yes, I have two kids. I'm not sure whether or not they'd be interested in joining the club, but they don't have their own bikes yet. Is it possible to hire them here? Absolutely. We do everything we can to encourage people of all ages to take up cycling. 
You can pay monthly, which works out cheaper, or each time you attend a weekly excursion. It depends how often you think you'll be joining us on rides, really. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. I assume the rides you do are local? Most of them, yes. We do longer trips when the weather's better. We sometimes stay away camping to make the most of it. One of our favourite excursions, most summers, is riding along the river as far as Brownside. That's about 100 kilometres away. Though this year we're going to the mountains, which will make a change. At some point in the future, we'll try the Lake District. That's something we've wanted to do for a while. And you hold other kinds of events too, don't you? I heard you do an annual charity event. Is that right? Yes, we do. We raised money for a new classroom at the local school last year through our sponsored bike ride. We have some other fun events too, like a party each year to celebrate the club's birthday. Members are welcome to bring their friends and family along to that. Brilliant. Well, I think that's about everything. Oh, do you have the telephone number for the cycling shop you mentioned? Yes, just a second. Ah, here we are. It's double two one... Double three seven. Great. Oh, one more thing. It was my neighbour who told me about the club and suggested I contact you. But do you have a website where you put information? We do indeed. Go to www.getoutside, that's all one word, dot com. Great. Thanks. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section one is now complete. Now look at section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk on the radio about letter writing. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now for the last part of today's programme, I'd like to welcome author Erica Winter, whose recent book entitled Say It in a Letter has already sold 10,000 copies. Over to you, Erica. Thanks, Mark. In today's world, it's easy to think that letters are a thing of the past. We rarely write them, and when we do, it's usually to a bank or an organisation of some kind. We no longer tend to write letters to our friends. Yet, this is something I think we will come to regret. It's what I call the lost art of letter writing. For one thing, letters used to consist of more than writing. Looking through some of my mother's old letters to me recently, 
I came across several that also had drawings in them. This wasn't uncommon in the past. Photos took much longer to print than they do now, and so people often drew something to show what they meant. In fact, my mother still does this, not only in her letters, but also sometimes on the envelopes. Another important thing about letters is that they represent one side of a conversation. And before the time of emails, these conversations could centre on people's deepest secrets. As a child, letters would come through our door each morning from relatives and friends. As we got older, they became more personal. This made the letters important. It made you want to keep them. The ones I treasure I still have. They're tied up with ribbon and safely stored in a shoebox in my attic. I get them out from time to time and read them, and it's amazing because they remind me of how I felt all those years ago. What I was doing, who I was meeting, what I was looking forward to. And this is another thing about letters. They recreate the past rather like a diary. Yet they are more than that because they invite a response. Emails will never tell us about the past in anything like the same way unless we print them off and keep them. But who has time for that? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. So if you want to give letter writing a try, and in the years ahead you may be very glad that you did, here are a few important tips. First, using a pen and paper is very different from using a keyboard and a screen. We can't easily change what we write with a pen, and so letters show much more of the thought process of the writer. And to get those thought processes going, you really need to make sure that the room you write in is a quiet one. And this means removing all mobiles, computers, tablets and other distractions. Second, it's much more inspiring to write on decent writing paper using a fountain pen than it is to use an old notepad and a ballpoint pen. So make sure you have the equipment you need. It shows that you've taken the trouble to present your letter in the best possible way. Also, your letter will stand the test of time. Cheap paper quickly falls apart. As I said earlier, a letter is really one side of a conversation, and because of this, you may be asking your recipient, that's the person receiving your letter, to give you some answers to problems that you have. So, in other words, use your letters as a tool. If you're worried about your job, for example, you can consult others about the things that are bothering you and so get the sort of advice that you need. You need to practice to make this really work for you, though. You need to think carefully about the wording of each question that you ask so that you get the answers you need. Unlike emails that we tend to write quickly without paying too much attention to wording, letters need patience and thought. And lastly, make sure you know how to begin a letter, where to put your address and the date, for example, and how to finish your letter depending on your recipient. Should you say best wishes or yours sincerely or simply love from? The ending you use must be suitable 
or you might offend people. This will be something some listeners may have forgotten or never had the chance to learn in the first place. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at section three. Section three. You will hear two students talking about a course they are doing in Chinese at university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. I'm really enjoying our Chinese language course so far, aren't you? Yeah, I definitely made the right choice coming to this university. The teaching's so good, isn't it? I love the methods our tutors use. They really get the most out of us. I never thought I'd learn so much so quickly. Goes to show what a difference it makes being taught by native speakers. <laughs> If I'd known about that in advance, it would have confirmed my choice absolutely. It's an aspect of the course which is really useful. It's cool having lots of options to choose from too, as far as topics to study is concerned, though that wasn't something I really considered in much detail when I was deciding where to study. I know what you mean. I have to say I'm finding the culture course absolutely fascinating. Mm. I'm glad that's on the timetable. By the way, how are you finding living away from home in a big city? Well, it was a bit of a nightmare at first, having grown up in a sleepy village in the middle of nowhere. I do miss the peace and quiet sometimes, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I had to try something new. That's why I'm here too. There's no way I could live in the country. I'd be bored out of my mind. Do you think you'll spend the third year studying abroad? We have the choice whether or not to go, don't we? Why else would I have registered here? It's an unmissable opportunity, wouldn't you say? I'm with you there. It isn't as expensive to do as some of the study abroad programmes at other universities. Thankfully. Anyway, have you seen the list of study groups for next semester yet? We're allowed to join two. I'm having trouble deciding which ones to join, actually. I'd like to do them all, though I know we won't have time, what with our regular lectures and everything. Well, there's the grammar study group. My grammar could definitely do with a bit of polishing, though I have to confess I'm probably likely to give that a miss. I've come to the same conclusion. The writing skills group would definitely be useful, especially if we end up working in China at some point. I'd rather get my speaking skills up to scratch. You can never do enough practice there, so that's something I'm going to sign up for. I'll go with that. What about literature analysis? Fancy that? Getting to grips with Chinese literature sounds like a real challenge. And one I'll attempt at some later date, I think. I was thinking about putting my name down for it, though, to be honest, I might be better off putting some work into understanding what people are saying to me. So, I think I'll go for that group. I know what you mean. That's that decided then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. How have you been finding the free online resources we've been given access to? I found one or two of them useful, but some of them aren't as exciting as I'd expected them to be. Right. I tried the chat room the other day for the first time. 
you know, where you can make contact with real Chinese speakers and practice your language skills. I was chatting to a really helpful user called May. The connection was pretty poor though, and I gave up in the end. I don't know whether it's always like that. I had a similar experience, waiting ages for replies to come through. And what about the translation software? I've never been a great fan of it, but that stuff is really high tech, isn't it? It's got all sorts of functions, though maybe at the expense of getting a precise interpretation of what you're trying to say. You don't have to wait as long as you do for some translation software to do its stuff, but I think what you said is a universal problem with that kind of thing. Better to use our heads. What do you think of the vocabulary builder? You know what? There's tons of useful and functional stuff to practice on there. I spotted several errors, though, if you can believe that. I noticed that too. Maybe we should raise that with our tutors, let them know it's lacking in quality. We need top-rate stuff at our level. The dictionary's not bad, but I've seen ones that have some interesting extras like activity sections. Shame it doesn't have any of those. I know. They can be slow to use, though. The language lab's pretty lazy, isn't it? I've only used it a couple of times, but I'd agree. There seem to be plenty of delays when it's setting up, though you can do some interesting things on it once you've got it running. Then there's the writing checker, the thing you type into and it tells you what typing errors you've made. I got a bit bored doing the same thing after a while though. It's a bit limited in what it can do. I think I'd rather have my tutor's feedback. It would be better if it was a bit more interactive, though how that would work I'm not sure. Anyway, at least we've got access to the resources. They're better than nothing, even if they're not perfect. Right, shall we look at this next piece? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 is now complete. Now look at Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about teaching maths to young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Why are we studying this? That's a question that, as a high school maths teacher, I was asked a thousand times, and one that you, as trainee maths teachers, will certainly be asked in the future. What is it that makes maths seem so difficult and unapproachable for many students? Getting good at maths is less a matter of brain power than staying power. The difficulty lies in the amount of patience maths requires. And it needs persistence too. It's not a subject that comes automatically or intuitively to many students. Another question I used to be asked was, how am I going to use this in my life? And this is the crux of the matter. Unless students can really get to grips with the relevance of maths to their everyday lives, it makes teaching the subject a very tough task indeed, especially when they know that in this world of instant gratification, they can find answers to virtually any problem by doing a quick internet search. So what can we, as teachers, do to make maths more accessible and interesting to our students? Well. For a start, we need to help them see how maths is needed in their daily interactions. 
whether it's following a recipe or deciding how much paint you need for your kitchen walls, we need to help students see that it's maths that's at work in achieving these goals. It's easy to see why simply forcing students to employ methods of memorization or reciting formulas leads to a teacher's failure to inspire in the maths classroom. Maths is a universal language. Anywhere you go, you can interact with people in all walks of life and they'll understand you if you speak maths. The language of numbers can help anyone perform daily tasks and make essential decisions. For thousands of years, the same principles of maths have been practiced by mankind around the globe. In order to get things done, especially in modern society, you simply have to employ maths. Your proficiency in the subject, or even a little knowledge of the fundamental operations of it, can help you shop wisely and stay within a budget, or get your head round population growth. Maths is also critical to a range of professions, and whatever your background, if you've been taught the basic operations of maths, you have the potential to become a millionaire. Just as literacy helps us get ahead in life, so does counting and the ability to make informed financial decisions. And it doesn't stop at work or daily transactions. Less obvious benefits of studying maths include other real-life applications, such as the ability to learn to play a musical instrument, become a dancer, or sail a boat. So, what is it that we need to be teaching? Yes, it's difficult to see how some mathematical concepts translate to the world outside education. Perhaps you'll never use a particular formula in your job, but by learning the process, you'll have trained your brain to solve problems whilst reinforcing the basics of maths. There are, however, formulas which are more transparently useful. Things like an ability to properly assess risk or statistics. Things which even students should be able to see will equip them for the world beyond education. Maths makes our minds flexible enough to find solutions to complex, real-world problems. Maths is a cumulative discipline. You have to gain an understanding in one area before you can effectively go on to acquire another. From the basic foundation of addition and multiplication to the complexities of quadratic equations, the only way to build a framework of knowledge is to learn step by step. So, how did I answer that question, what is the point of doing this? Until I got my students thinking about how they use maths to download music from the internet and hand over their cash for popcorn at the cinema, nothing I said made any difference. So I asked them to imagine a life with no maths. That would mean no means of marking time with calendars or watches, no money or concepts like measurement. The idea of missing birthdays, not being able to top up their mobile phones, and a halt to the development of computer games made them open their eyes to the reality of life without maths. What better way to demonstrate the purpose of maths than to relate it to their own existence? Moving on now to another aspect of maths teaching. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.